Okay. All right. So I've been talking kind of in real generality and kind of cryptic roundabouts, talking about this attraction between the particles. All right. We're going to actually get down to that. We're going to we're going to dissect that now because it's it's clearly really important what the attraction between the particles is. It affects a lot of things like the boiling point, the vapor pressure, you know. It it affects a number of things. So, we need to talk about how we can figure out which things have a greater attraction to them like how does the attraction of one water molecule to the next water molecule compare to the attraction between one acetone molecule to the next acetone molecule? Okay. We figure this out by something called intermolecular forces. So let's break down the word. Intra means within. Inter means between. Between two molecules. So there's molecular. Between molecule force. So this is the attraction between molecules. What would an intramolecular force be? An intramolecular force is a bond, right? It's the forces within the molecule, so that's a bond. Okay, so the intramolecular force is an attractive force that acts between one molecule and another. They're a lot weaker than chemical bonds, right? This is why when you heat up water, it boils before it breaks apart into hydrogen and oxygen, right? So the bonds are a lot stronger. Intramolecular forces are weaker. However, there's a couple different kinds of intramolecular forces, and they definitely be ha affect a lot of things. They affect, uh, we'll see, solubility. They affect when they boil, when they freeze, tons of stuff. So this is really critical. And I'm going to tie a lot of pieces together here. There are three intermolecular forces that we're going to talk about. Dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonds, and London forces. And, here's the, and this is the order I'm going to talk about them in. Okay. Dipole-dipole interactions. This is the easiest to get your head around. And it's the easiest to identify in a molecule. Dipole-dipole interactions are simply attraction, attractive force that occur between polar molecules. So... If a molecule has two poles, a positive and a negative, then one end is attracted to the other. So if you have an a, a simple one, HF, HF, right? Simple molecule, right? And because fluorine is more electronegative than hydrogen, the fluorine end has a negative and the hydrogen end has a positive. And actually, I just realized this is a bad, this is a bad example for reasons I'll do later. Let's do hydrogen and chlorine. So, because of this, there's an attraction from the p negative and the positive, and they have a tendency to stick together. So, here's a little picture. It's kind of convoluted and messy, but what's happening is the molecules are constantly moving around trying to maximize the attractions. So, the negatives are trying to get as close to the negatives as they can, and the positives are trying to get as far from the other positives as they can, and vice versa. So... So the red ones are the attractions, and the blue ones are the repulsions, and they're trying to maximize, min-max the whole thing. So, but that's, you know, you don't really need to know this. Just understand how it works. So, simply put, here's how you can identify the criteria for something having dipole-dipole interactions. It's a simple test. Sorry, a little interruption there. Um, the, so the test to determine if something has dipole-dipole interactions is very simple, it's very binary. Is the molecule polar? Yes, no, and that is your answer. Polar molecules have dipole-dipole interactions. Non-polar molecules don't, very simply. So that's that's dipole-dipole. Pretty easy. Polar molecules, by their very nature, have a positive end and a negative end, so the attraction there is easy to see. Okay, next one is called hydrogen bonding. All right. The name is really deceptive. It's not a real bond. It's not a real intramolecular bond. So, but it is directly related to dipole-dipole interactions. So,
So, if you have the, the more polar the molecules, or rather the more, so like if you have HI and HBr, right? There's a negative here and a positive here. And then we have a, and then because bromine is more electronegative than iodine, there's a bigger differential, right? Between the negative and the positive. And if we go up to HCl, you know, it's an even bigger differential, right? So it's more polars, more of a strong one. So if we go all the way to the very edges of what we can do, of the very biggest differences in electronegativity, we can have really strong dipole-dipole interactions. So if I go hydrogen, one of the lowest electronegativity, one of the nonmetals with one of the, with the nonmetal with one of the lowest electronegativities, and fluorine, the element with the highest electronegativity, then we have a very strong dipole dipole interaction. In fact, what happens is you have your positive, you have your, you have your nuclei, the electron density gets pulled so much to the fluorine that what happens is you have this almost exposed proton with a very positive end. This makes for with between hydrogen fluoride and hydrogen fluoride, this makes a very strong attraction between this negative and this positive. So strong, in fact, that it is, it, there's this big jump in how strong it is compared to other dipole-dipole interactions. So it's so strong, it gets its own name. So this sort of attraction, which is not a bond, I need to clarify, not an actual bond, we call it hydrogen bonding, but this attraction is so strong that we get it, it's called hydrogen bonding. This occurs with a couple of combinations. Whenever you have, so whenever you have hydrogen directly bonded to nitrogen, hydrogen directly bonded to oxygen, or hydrogen directly bonded to fluorine. Now why am I emphasizing the word directly? because I could have a molecule like this, right? This is not going to give me hydrogen bonding, right? It's polar for sure, it's gonna be polar, but I'm not gonna get hydrogen bonding because while there is an oxygen and there is a hydrogen, they are not directly bonded to one another. This molecule instead this will have hydrogen bonding because of the oxygen and the hydrogen right next to it. So, the criteria of whether or not an atom, a molecule has hydrogen bonding is simply this. It will have hydrogen bonding if it is polar and it has hydrogen directly bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Generally, if hydrogen is directly bonded to one of those, it's going to be polar anyway. So just look for hydrogen directly bonded to one of those. So, there we go. So, to recap, dipole-dipole. You're just looking to see if molecules are polar or not. Hydrogen bonding. You're looking to see if hydrogen is directly bonded to oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen. So, you can already see that to be able to identify intramolecular forces, you have to be able to draw the structure you have to draw the Lewis structure and look at the shape and determine whether it's polar or not. Finally, oh, and, and water. The reason water is a liquid at room temperature and other things, even like carbon monoxide, which are polar, is not, is because of the hydrogen bonding. This is why water is so polar. This is why water is, has such strong interactions because of the hydrogen bonding. Okay, last one is called London forces. This one's really weird. So imagine helium. Helium has two electrons. Helium has two electrons only. And helium is not polar at all. It doesn't have a positive end and a negative end. But we do know that if we cool helium down enough, 
we can get it to condense to a liquid, which means there must be some attraction. What happens is, as the electrons are buzzing around, at any instant, you might have both electrons on one side of the helium, which gives a slight negative on that end and a slight positive. If it's close enough to another helium atom and it's moving slow enough, this might pull the electrons of that helium over and make it negative and this positive and so on and so forth. The more electrons that something has, so, by, so this is, these are London forces, this distribution. This is sometimes called induced dipole. Okay, important things about uh, London forces. Every molecule has London forces. All of them have London forces. It is also the weakest intermolecular force. So anything that has dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding pretty well overshadows the London forces. So you're, you'll often end up associating London forces with nonpolar molecules, not because they're the only ones that have it, but because that's the only force they have and it's very weak. So nonpolar molecules don't stick together well because all they have is London forces. The, the larger a molecule is, the larger its molar mass, the more electrons it has, the more of a charge you can get by sloshing these electrons around, and the greater the strength of the London forces. I am not going to t ask you to discern when the London forces will be strong enough to overshadow dipole-dipole. Uh, so basically, London forces are the weakest, dipole-dipole are next, and hydrogen bonds are the strongest. So, so here's what it means. Stronger intermolecular forces leads to higher boiling point and melting point and lower vapor pressure.